You're listening to Life Check Yourself with life coach, transformational leader, and dating and relationship badass, Marnie Batista. Every week, you'll get the raw truth from top experts and real people on the important life and love issues you want to know about. So if you're ready to life check yourself in your relationships, your career, and the areas of your life that matter most to you, and you're not afraid to be called out on your uh, stuff, then you're ready for what's next. Life Check Yourself with Tracy Crossley. Understanding your attachment style so you stop missing out on opportunities with the great guys. Ladies, welcome to Life Check Yourself. Oh, girlfriends and men friends. Uh, I have a guest here who's going to help you life check your ass. Um, and you guys all are so interested in this topic about attachment you live for it. So that is why I have Tracy Crossley here. She is a behavioral relationship expert. She's an author. Uh, she's a podcast host and she helps people with unhealthy life and relationship patterns, transforming things like imposter syndrome. Does that sound familiar? Uh, insecure attachment. Raise your hand if you got that one. Uh, negative belief systems, breaking the cycle of narcissistic damage, destructive damn self-talk. Uh, she's got a background in psychology. She has an innate emotional, emotional intuition. She has had her own personal experience, and she's going to talk to us about how you can permanently change the repetition of those damn unforgiving, unhealthy, unhappy, unfulfilled cycles. Uh, in your life, personally and professionally. I am so happy that you are here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, let's just get started right away um, with this whole idea of attachment and insecure attachment. And bless the soul. I don't even remember the name of the author that wrote that book about attachment styles, but so many listeners and humans, you know, have read that book, know that work, they like anchor in it, they're like, have an identity around it, which is amazing. But then it's like, well, what the hell do you do with it? So let's talk about insecure attachment. So how do you define it, define it? And uh, what can we do to move from insecure to healthy? Well, there's a lot and they could probably talk for hours, right? On all the things. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a deep subject. But one of the things, you know, like I read Attached years ago, and unfortunately for me, it was more of an experience of like, really, this is a crock of shit, because I, I had to identify like as an anxious avoidant. And in that book, it specifically says, well, if you're both of these things, you're kind of screwed. Um, and I thought, okay, I can't be screwed. I can't live the rest of my life in this dysfunctional space. So anyways, um, no, I want to like, stop you there just for one second, because yeah. that Maybe I was like leaking my sort of like same opinion around that. Like, I feel like when you get labeled in anything, right, and you take on that identity, mm -hmm. right, it, it feels overwhelming and it feels like a, like a death sentence, right? And so I'm really <laughs> grateful that you read that book and you were like, fuck that. Like, that's good information. I like now I have a name for it, but you were like, that's not going to be the rest of my life. So for those of you who are listening, you read that book and you're like, I'm this. I just really want you to hear Tracy saying like, and then what did I do about it? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. So first of all, you know, I'll get back to you with the attachment. So I went off of the original attachment theory or what I thought was the original attachment theory. There's actually been several of them. Uh, the most famous one being John Bowlby, who was noticing there was a difference between secure attachment and insecure attachment. And then Mary Ainsworth was his assistant, and she's the one who did this experiment with um, mothers, was the caregiver. And, and in the 1960s, of course, you're talking, the mother was a caregiver. It was pretty much that. And so what they did were um, took these children up to the age of two years old and put them in a room with the mom and a stranger. And what they did was they experimented. They experimented with the stranger being in the room, the mother leaving, um, or the stranger not being there and the mother leaving, like there were all these variations of it. But basically what it came to was children would react in certain ways when their mom would leave. And the ones that were securely attached 
you know, they might be upset that mom would leave, but then they tended to self-soothe. They tended to be okay. And they didn't reject the mom when the mom would come back in. And with some of these insecure attachment types, like they had kids that were ambivalent, kids that were anxious, kids that would completely avoid mom, you know, no physical contact, no, no eye contact, nothing. Um, and they discovered, hey, there's something with attachment style. And so this evolved. And what's funny, but not funny, is that we tend to carry all of this, of course, into adulthood because we learned our original attachment, how we receive love what we think love is, attention, all of those things. And we incorporated it into our own relational dynamics so that as we grow up, we tend to see ourselves in a specific way. We see others in a specific way, um, you know, and our beliefs tell us, oh, hey, you know, maybe I'm not worth it if I have a form, let's say I'm anxious and I anxiously attach and I feel like I can't live without somebody and I feel like they're going to go away because I have a fear of abandonment. And so all of that to say, um, when you have somebody, let's say that is anxiously attached, their self-worth is really riding on that attachment and avoidant, same thing, but just played out differently. Like each attachment style plays out differently, but it's still a self-worth issue. Mm, it did always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, listeners. Um, okay. So I think this is really, really interesting in that when you look at that early formed attachment style, and then you either have a fear of being left, a fear of abandonment, so you're anxious or you're avoidant. What, what's that fear of? Like being trapped? Like what's the, what's the, resultant behavior or thinking pattern in the avoidant attachment style? So the avoidant attachment style basically is afraid of being engulfed or rejected. And they tend to completely avoid relationships or they get into relationships, but they're not emotionally available, right? You can still be in a relationship and be completely unavailable. And for them, it's this fear of letting somebody in. And most people who have it, they don't really go deep enough to understand what it is. They just know, oh my God, I feel this fear. I've got to get away from this person or I've got to create distance or I have to do something that's going to give me the space to feel like I'm back in control of myself. And so those are the kind of feelings they get about it, but they may not be able to go, okay, I understand what's triggering this. I understand why I'm reacting this way. Most just go into reaction. And the other part of that is, if they're single, they tend to look for the perfect partner that doesn't mm, exist, right? right? Like fantasy partner, you know? So yes. that's like a never ending hunt for something like, you know, a unicorn. Good luck. Not going to find it. Definitely. No, definitely not. So this is, this is great. That's like a, such a powerful just framework to kind of have this conversation. in. so one thing that you talk about, um, which I think is so huge is this idea that feeling your feelings is not the same as having an emotional reaction. And how, so when we talk about emotional intelligence and EQ and wanting to transform these, how do feeling your feelings and having emotional reactions play into it? What's the difference? Okay. So it's, I love this question, by the way, um, <laughs> it's because it's so interesting when I first start working with people they're very much in the, well, I'm crying or I'm mad, but they don't realize that a lot of the emotional reactions come from a story. They, mm. There's some kind of narrative, right, that they're reacting to. And it's in their head and they believe it's playing outside of them. You know, it's like going through a filter outside. And so often people are reacting to that rather than knowing what is my deeper motivating feelings? Because there's a motivator behind that reaction. Mm. You know, it's not just you cry and, oh, that's a, that's a feeling. Well, yeah, you can feel it, but it's not a true feeling that's going to lead you anywhere to where you can do something about it. So when you're just having a reaction, so is it that, oh, I'm crying, therefore I must be sad. I'm, I'm, my face is red and my heart is racing. I'm angry. Like, ex what do you mean by like the difference between just, you know, basic emotions that come out in our physical expression versus like the actual feeling 
around, underneath it. So like when you are crying or you're mad, right, you're reacting to something, right? It's not an original action. You're not, it's not, um, how do I explain this a little bit better, just so it's not so esoteric, but it's like, you get deep enough when you connect to your true feelings, they're on a deeper level, they actually don't feel as movable as things that are transient, like crying or getting angry, because nobody usually stays angry, it usually turns to resentment, or, you know, you stop crying. Um, you basically are in a state. And the state is usually caused by something you're saying to yourself. Okay, so mm -hmm. the narrative being, this happened to me, say, you're a victim, let's say, most of the time, that's what we do. Um, you know, I'm not saying everybody's a bunch of victims, but we tend to victimize ourselves in these stories, right? especially when you're upset, like somebody's done something to me. This is somebody else's fault. I shouldn't be in this position. And then sometimes, you know, you can get into crying because you're like, oh my God, I hate myself. I can't believe I did that. I'm such an idiot. And you're really just kind of having an inner critic moment where that inner critic is taking over and beating you up. But the point of this is these aren't going to a deeper place. It's sort of at a surface level, because if you look at when you're crying, it's sort of a loop, right? You don't yes. really get deeper. Yes. So, <laughs> no, I just, I, I connect everything yeah. lately to reality TV, which is so, so sad, but true. Because I, I always, we talk about it when we do our little recap shows about how like you see these cast members, like they're crying, right? Like they're having that reaction, mm -hmm. but then they're not really actually like, it's the narrative or the story they have going on, but they never get to like, how am I really like, feeling about this or what's really going on or what's really true or what's not true and getting to that deeper place. Mm -hmm. Right. And especially, and I think this is happens in dating and relationships a lot. People get in these uh, loops, right. Of re of using those reactions to elicit another reaction to, to mm -hmm. get what they want. Right. Like if I cry with my boyfriend, then he finally stops being a dick and like puts his arm around me and we can stop. I think I can stop the pain or, you know, if I'm mad, then I feel powerful and that person will, you know, and I don't talk to them for a while. That person will come back or whatever it is. So what can people do to actually get into the, get to the deeper place and get out of that narrative? So one of the things that you can do is to, and this, when I say these things, it's not snap your fingers, boom, right. you're there. Okay. <laughs> Amen. So, give your, yeah, so yeah. totally give yourself grace and give yourself time because one of the first things you have to do is to look at the reality. What is the reality? Okay. Not what your version of the reality or what fantasy or idea, because a lot of times we get into fantasy about things like I want it to be this way, but it's not this way. And I have a lot of disappointment and I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to stay in a fantasy about it. And really, it's to deal with what is the reality? You know, like, let's say you're uh, dating somebody and they are kind of ghosting you, you know, where they're not showing up and they're coming back. I call it breadcrumbing. But, yeah. you know, they yeah. So let's say that's going on. And in your mind, you're like, well, they're my soulmate. They're the person I'm meant to be with. So I've got to put up with this shit. And the problem is you're not really dealing with the reality. This person is inconsistent. The relationship is not progressing. These are the things that you have to deal with and you got to feel your way through it. You got to let yourself feel the disappointment. You have to let yourself be in reality. The other thing you do, and this is probably slightly easier depending on the level of, I would say, shame that you tend mm -hmm. to give to yourself. Yeah. A lot of us shame crap out of ourselves, right? So the other thing is to take responsibility for your choice. You are making mm -hmm. a choice to be where you are. And people want to argue that like somebody placed them there, but you're not held hostage in a relationship or you're not held hostage in a dating situation. You are making an active choice to say, yep, I'm here. It feels kind of crunchy. It feels kind of shitty. It feels kind of like, oh, I can't blame anybody else. It feels difficult. But to be honest with you, once you get past all of those feelings, the reactions, and then you get deeper into what, what is my motivation to be here? You know, that's the third thing is to understand not to beat yourself up because beating yourself up, don't ever do it. It doesn't help. Um, I, my saying that, of course, doesn't really help either. But I know. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> I like that you said that. You're like, I'm on the bandwagon. I'm waving from the car to the people on the side of the road, but I know that I can't really change it for you. But I like that. Yep. 
Yep. So, you know, the, the third thing, though, is really, what is my deeper motivation? Yes. You know? Okay, I get it. You know, and when you start to get that, then you can empower yourself to make different choices. Then you might not choose to be there. But you don't have to pressure yourself or force yourself because what happens when you do that is you get stuck in the cycle of struggle. And mm -hmm. you're already in a struggle. So then you're just multiplying your struggles. So don't feel like you've got to hurry. Take your time so that you can really understand why you're motivated to do these things to yourself. Mm, I think you said like 14,000 profound things, but one thing that I want to <laughs> highlight is taking your damn time, right? I think what you said about those reactions, those emotional reactions, and I talked about those little loops that you get in, like it takes a minute to say like, what is my deeper motivation? And to really sort of process that. So is, do you like recommend do you journal on that question? Would you meditate on that question? Would you, how, how do you advise people process or have access to that, the, the depth of that question? Okay. So what I usually do is I start people because I want people to get in their bodies. Most yep. people are in their heads, right? Yep. And so we walk around like a body supporting a head. So it's really about when you feel like something happens, let's say that you're waiting for a text message that you never get, right? You have anxiety. You're like, what should I do? All you're doing is you're in that loop of that story about whatever you're assuming. Okay. And the word assuming right. <laughs> is going on, right? And so it's, okay, let me close my eyes for a second and let me see if I can find any tension or pain in my body. If I can find anything related to a feeling, I'm going to focus there. It's hard to do it at first. It's going to take more than once. It may take you multiple times. But the point of it is your body holds your emotions. Your emotions aren't held in your head. Your head doesn't have emotions in it. It thinks emotions. It can't feel them. And why I tell people to do this is eventually a couple things happen. There's like, um, you know, things that I do that are releases where I help people to walk through those things and basically make a shift. But I'm not doing that obviously right now. Right. But the thing, you know, but the thing that you can do is you get into the feeling, let's say that you're finding your chest is tight. Okay. Okay. And a lot of times when you have anxiety, it is, or you're sick to your stomach when you have anxiety. Right. And if you can just like ride the wave of the feeling and, and you got to stick with it, right? Ride the wave and it will go away Yeah, and you will be less anxious. And what will happen is you're going to feel more in control of yourself. This is so brilliant. I, I've been practicing this with my husband, <laughs> right? Because like really like, right. Because I'm really working this brand new baby year on trying to really break patterns, right. Of old stuff. And so I'm just noticing that feeling. And then I just sit there in the feeling like I'm feeling this feeling. Wow. It's so weird. It's in my chest. Wow. It really does, really does feel intense. It's still there. It's still there. And then sort of, then it, it dissipates. And from that place, then I can get a little more clarity or go back to asking like the why question or having a conversation. So is there, and I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Is there like any science that says it will go away in like 74 seconds or like, <laughs> is, there, is there a thing about like how long a feeling lasts in your body? You know, it's really interesting because I've done so much research on this, right? Because of course I had to go through all of this myself, especially when I read attach and I'm like, okay, no way in hell. Um, and this was one way that it changed my attachment style, by the way, folks, just FYI. Um, but you know, when you're in your body, it really depends on the depth of the feeling because some of it is really old shit, like yeah. going back to childhood. So you're going to find that that feeling comes back. Like one of the questions you can ask, like when you're, let's say, waiting for the text that's not coming, right? You can go, when's the first time I felt this way? And if you keep your eyes closed and you keep focused on whatever that pain or discomfort is in your body, you will get an image and your subconscious speaks an image. It's not going to like your subconscious isn't going to go, well, blah, 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 blah. That's not your subconscious. That's your mind. And it's trying to fill in the, the blanks with the narrative. Your subconscious, however, like dreams, right? Images come up in dreams. Well, this is the same thing. You want to pay attention to what's the image. Oh, wow. I'm five years old in that picture. 
Mm. Be curious about what's happening. Let it unfold. It's usually, and it's really interesting to me too, because it's usually a clue. Most of us will not hang with it long enough because we'll disregard it as, oh, this is stupid. You know, this isn't making any sense. And I'll tell you why I say that. I had a client at one point, like when I first started coaching and he, we were doing this in person at the time and he closed his eyes and he's like in the, his stomach, I believe at the time. And he goes, well, I'm getting this really stupid image. I'm like, why is it stupid? He goes, well, I'm like four years old and I'm sitting on a doorstep. I'm like, well, four-year-old sitting on a doorstep. What are you doing? He goes, I'm looking at my fingers. I said, why? He said he was waiting for the babysitter to open the door. I said, Mm. what time is it? He said, six in the morning. Okay. There's a four-year-old sitting on a doorstep at six in the morning, right? Like, that's a little weird. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And so this whole picture unfolded. And it was the story and it was horrible. Like, you know, him and his little brother got dropped off as, by his mom at six in the morning to the sitter. She was a single mom years ago and the babysitter didn't like him. And so she would make them sit outside till seven in the morning and then she would open the door and then she did all sorts of other things to him. But it was, it unfolded into this whole, you know, story that he would never have had any idea of had he not sat through and gone, okay, what's next? What's happening Mm. here? So, so you can learn a lot about yourself, right? Because these stories are sort of tucked away in the feelings. And so that's my point. Like, you know, if it's really old like that, give it time. It's probably going to have a multitude of situations attached to that same feeling. Like, let's say, you know, you're feeling anxious. It's like, okay, when's the first time I felt anxious? Well, you just might hit on one but that might not actually be the first time that Mm -hmm. might be the strongest time. So again, you have to have the patience with yourself to do this. And what's so great about what you're saying, Tracy, is that we get so caught up in the story that doesn't, it's not going to solve anything. It may or may not be true, right? You're talking about the, the, the narrative or the story that you think is attached, the one that's the reaction, not the feeling. And so when you are patient and slow and self compassionate and you go to the feeling, and then you can ask yourself, and it's like you said, be courageous um, and be in it. That's where the opportunity is for the truth and for freedom from this identity of like, I'm going to be this way forever. It takes, mm-hmm. a, it takes a lot of damn courage. Okay. So now is this the 90 second thing? How to change your life? Did you just tell me that? <laughs> or is that another okay. magical tool you have? <laughs> you know, it's so funny because the work I do is so deep and for some people it can take months, right. To get to certain places because, you know, it's like you get into the, as I was just talking about that whole narrative, right? Like you can get into that, but then what do you do with it? And that's, you know, where we go into different directions with it. So what I decided was, can I come up with some really like quick tools that people could use? So this is the 90 second tool where, all right, people should... get ready. 90 <laughs> seconds, baby. Everyone has 90 damn seconds. All right. Yeah. A life check yourself tool. What is it? Okay. This is a, it is a life check yourself tool, by the way. Okay. So you go on a date and this is a date you don't really go, want to go on. Like you saw their profile online. You're just kind of like, eh, I don't know about this person. So you're going to go because you're curious or whatever. You've talked yourself into it. Marnie, made, know, Marnie you know. made you go. <laughs> Marnie made you go. <laughs> and so you're at this date and you're feeling an urge to bolt. You want to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. There is something bothering you about this person. Okay. So what happens is you start to pay attention to that. All the ways you can think of to get out of there. Can I climb out the bathroom window? Can, you know, I signal to the bartender, Oh, you got to call at the bar. I mean, you know, whatever people right. come up with crazy stuff. Right. So instead it's to sit there and be curious about how you're feeling. Okay. So you got that urge to pull. Be curious, what are you afraid is going to happen? Because the urge to bolt comes from fear. That's straight up fear, has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with something your mind is telling you, okay? So be curious. And when you can stay and be curious and withstand the feeling of wanting to, that urgency of wanting to leave, you're usually gonna find on the other side, there was really no reason for the urgency to leave. It's an old you know, pattern of fear that has come up. So there's a, probably a fear of 
losing control of making the wrong decision. And what is that going to mean? I'm going to end up alone. You know, so you want to be able to withstand those kind of feelings. And I use this all the time in my coaching and people are like, yeah, I listened to Tracy and I stayed 90 seconds longer. And I found out that there was really nothing to be afraid of, or I found out that I really don't want a relationship or I found out, you know, whatever it happens to be. Right. And it can be in any situation, any situation you want to bolt from any situation where you can't stand it another minute, any situation. And, and this isn't just like physically you want to leave. Like you start to change the subject. You ever do that? Like the conversation gets uncomfortable yes. and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> yep. So at that point, instead of trying to change subject, shut up and listen, oh, right? Yeah, 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 it's yeah. It's yeah. going to be, yeah. So it's super uncomfortable, but be curious when you do it. Don't just stop and go, okay, I'm going to sit here because that's not going to do anything. You actually have to be curious about yourself. Why in the hell am I reacting this way? What is going on inside of me? You know, have curiosity, have curiosity about the other person only in terms of how the hell they're triggering you. Oh my God. Because that's all they are. I'm going to, so I just have, this has nothing to do with dating, but um, I was in a, a social situation over the weekend with two other couples and one of the guys mm-hmm. like his did is doing his January 1st, like um, eating healthy, like trying to lose weight situation. And we went out to dinner and the dessert comes and he's like, no, I'm not going to have dessert. And he's like, oh, I wish I would have started this diet February 1st, not January 1st. And the other woman and the other couple goes, well, it doesn't seem like you're on a diet from what you ordered f- so far. And I was like, <laughs> no! And I literally, Tracy, I couldn't do it. I, I, I could, I literally like could not wait 90 seconds. I, I literally went like, rushed in. And I was like, oh, well, no. See, he's saying no to dessert. And I was just like, oh. And it, I'm bringing this up because this is not just dating shit. This was like, why did I feel... Like I had to go in and rescue my friend, right? Um, mm-hmm. And get involved. It was so not my conversation because of the, you know, that feeling that I was having. And if I did this process and I sat with it, I, I could have learned. And now I am going to go back and look. Like what was going on for me that I felt like I had to go in and rescue? And the top line is, mm-hmm. you know, and when I was growing up, my dad would say mean things to my mom, and then I'd be like. No, that's me. What you really mean, right? I was in the middle that would always mm-hmm. kind of interpret, right? So that's just this habit I have. But I love 90 seconds. Next time, I'm just going to like literally count to 10 nine times. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because you know what? You do discover so much more about yourself. And the more self awareness we have, the better our decisions are. And the more we learn to trust ourselves. Because I always like to say, and this is super fucked up, by the way, but it's, this is so true. In life, we do not trust people whose words and actions don't match, right? Yeah, like yeah. if somebody says, yeah, I'll be there at seven and they show up at nine. Okay. Are you trusting that person? Hell no. So what about you? Yeah. What about your words and actions matching, right? And that's just, that's why I say it's super fucked up because you start to realize how much your words and actions don't match most of the time. Yeah. And be the person you want to attract. So it's about... And the other thing is too, like, I was just telling my daughter this, who's 26 the other day. It's like, you know, we have to, um, to create that new pat and that new neural wiring. Like we, we have to just take baby steps towards having our own words and actions match. And it might be one step forward, one step back. Right. Because Mm -hmm. that thing, like I got to get the hell out of here or, um, he didn't text me. So I'm texting him. Like, do you like me? Do you love me? Um, it comes on real, real strong. So it's really about just whatever behavior reaction you have. Can you be curious about it? Is what I hear you saying. Exactly. And also to take responsibility. Yeah. And another thing too, that I, I really get into is people tend to focus on the other person and it's not about the other person. It's always about you. It's your reaction to the other person because you can line 10 people up in a room and we can all have a different reaction to the same event, to the same person. And it's always about what are your expectations, why you don't look inward and you look outward. And I mean, there's so many reasons that are related to attachment, related to upbringing, related to culture. But the point is, until you start looking at not he made me or she made me or what's happening with them. Or if I'm explaining a situation, if I ask you a question, like I do this often, like, Oh, Hey, 
you know, how did that situation go? How did you feel? I'll say, how did you feel? They'll start talking immediately about what the other person did. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> instead of, well, this is how I felt. It, it, I sit there in amazement going, okay, they did not even get close to answering how they felt. Yeah. So it's like, you got to look at yourself and ha- that's the best place to look. I say hashtag FF, the fucking feelings. Um, okay. <laughs> I have a question for you about imposter syndrome. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think a lot of people have this sort of imposter syndrome in in relationship, in intimate relationships. So first of all, how do you define it? And then how do we connect to really our like essential self or our authentic self? Okay. So we're super intelligent first. Let's start there. And you know, what we've decided at some early age, again, where we don't have any kind of self-awareness going on because, you know, most of us were just trying to soak up the information, right? We're kids. We don't know any better. So kind of learn things like, oh, when I am really loud, nobody likes it. Okay. So I should be quieter. Mm. Okay. I'm going to be quiet, right? I'm boisterous. I'm not going to be boisterous anymore. You know, so what we start to do is we wheel and deal as a kid for what characteristics really work for the kind of attention we want. Um, You know, oh, look, you know, you're winning um, every game you play of soccer. So you're a soccer star, right? So we tend to put more energy and effort into the things that please other people and let them, you know, keep us around you know, they're not abandoning us or but they're not critiquing us and they're not telling us we're bad. So we develop this character from this. We don't mm. develop ourselves, right? We just take those traits and we stitch them together and we're like, yeah, I'm super smart. I'm super funny. I'm super, whatever, whatever the characteristics are. And then we go about living our lives in the world, whether it's in a relationship or at a job. And yet the issue with it is letting people get close to you can feel like you want to bolt because there is a fear of being found out for who you really are, because it is Mm. not this other person. That's parts of you, but that's not really you. Because a lot of us, when we're stitching parts of ourselves together and we've become an imposter, we've tried to be the perfect imposter. We've tried to be the Mm. perfect person so that we get the love and attention and whatever it is, the validation that we are searching for, that's what we do. And if if you're doing that, there comes a point I would guess, uh, in my experience, is that it's not sustainable. So then shit blows up. Right. Yep. It always blows up. And the problem is, then you have all that shame that goes with it, because you feel like, oh, my God, I did this. I'm, you know, a horrible human being, blah, 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 blah. You know, the whole story that goes with it. And you go right back to childhood to the time you were shamed for whatever characteristic you and let's say crossed out, you know, you said, well, I'm not going to be that boisterous person anymore because this, when I act quietly, I get better attention for that. Mm. So all of that usually comes up when everything falls apart, right? All those characteristics that you've hidden. It's like, oh, look, surprise, everything is here. Mm. And you just feel like you're the worst person in the world, but it's not true. And you have to learn to accept yourself. And it's not so simple again. And I, I hate saying that like, oh God, it's not another simple thing. It's not simple because we have a relationship to this imposter. This imposter, perhaps it's gotten us raises at work, promotions at work. It's gotten us to the top, right? It's something where we've had the relationship that it looks great on the outside, but sucks on the inside, right? So all of, right? And those things, it's a risk to lose those things. And yet to let people actually see who we are is very, very difficult because we've convinced them we're this other person. Mm, this is so interesting because when you're in that, um, when you're attached to that identity of that imposter, um, there are so many conscious and unconscious gains of it. One being like, we feel safe and, or mm-hmm. the illusion of safety uh, and we feel in control because we know it. And I think that's what people get so, so terrified about, which is why I'm all about living your courageous life is because it takes courage to step out of the imposter and really be just be. (laughs) Yeah, it does. And it's, you know, and the thing is most of us don't even know who that is, you know, the real us. Right. And, and, but I think the cool thing with that is it's kind of fun 
to find out who you are if you make it a journey of curiosity, like literally be curious instead of judgmental, be curious. Oh, do I like this? Am I, am I acting in ways that really exude how I truly feel or am I filtering it because I know my audience over here, you know, they're not going to like it if I act in a certain way, or at least I assume that, right? So it's maybe I just say what's really true and it may come out in a way where you feel like you're choking on your words, but that's okay. You know, it's like you have to give yourself again, that grace and that compassion to do that. Mm, it's yeah. And, and then there's no mistakes, right? Because if you approach it from curiosity, then everything that happens is a window, like all these great tools, all these great things you're talking about are just entry points and high quality questions you can ask that point in the direction of ourselves, as you said, when we take responsibility and we have curiosity, then this journey, this messiness of life uh, is the way that we unfold, like unfold ourselves um, into having, you know, a life that's sort of like lived on our own terms where, where we're being authentic with the right people and the right work and, you know, the right play and fun and all those different kinds of things of our lives. So I think that's amazing. Okay. My last question <laughs> for you. Um, if you were going to sort of think about, um, when you read that book and you were like, hell no, was there something that you kept remembering along that journey? Like, so that you stayed in the curiosity so that you got out of those moments of shame or fear or hurt, like that kept you on the pathway. So I ended up making a promise to myself. I don't know if it was around the same time I read that book. It's kind of like uh, that whole time in my life. It's like one big giant clusterfuck, right? Yeah. So, um, and so, but what I do remember is at the time I had a yo-yo relationship, right? Um, somebody would come in my life, leave my life, come in my life, leave my life. And when he would leave, sometimes I was like, okay, get the hell out of my life. I can't deal with you anymore. You know, fuck you. You won't give me what I want, blah, 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 that whole thing. Okay. And had one of those and I'm walking along, literally walking on the street, doing my daily walk. And I hear from him. Mm. And I, at that moment, this is what, and this was like the whole game changer for me. I hear from him and I feel, oh my God, anxiety, shit. I feel, oh my God, I'm wanting to be here. So what I remembered, you know, or what I remember now is that I, at that point, I'm like, oh my God, no matter if this guy comes or goes, I feel the same freaking way every time he shows back up. Mm. Like I kept thinking I was over it. I was done, but I was numb. So when you're numb, that's not really a true place that you can be emotionally. Something can knock you out of it really quickly. So what happened was I had that moment and I was like, oh my God, I can't even believe this. I cannot believe in two seconds and back to where I was two months ago or whenever the last time I talked to this guy. Right. Uh, yes. And I, and I went, oh my God, I'm the fucking common denominator. I am the problem. It like hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized if I feel the same, okay, that's about me. And so at that moment, I also realized I was super disconnected from my emotions, except for anxiety, right? And that's what I mean. Like anxiety is really not, it's a symptom to whatever the heck is actually going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew there had to be something. And so I made a promise to myself that I am emotionally going to see this situation through until I have clarity and resolution. And I'm not letting myself react and hang up on him or tell him to go fuck himself or any of the other things that I've done. I'm going to sit like the 90 second rule, except yep. like I didn't know how long it was going to be kind yep. of a thing. And, you know, and I, I had to start speaking my truth, which at first was a lot of blame and I didn't understand. I was still blaming him for everything. And then when I realized, oh, I have responsibility in this. Oh, what the hell am I doing? How am I creating this? So it was that moment though, because I made this promise to myself that I wasn't going to do my usual bullshit and I was going to stick with it no matter how hard it was. That's what really just changed everything over time. Mm, I love this. First of all, I think we have like parallel paths. Like my moment was like, oh my God, I'm the common denominator in all my failed relationships. Holy shit. That, I mean, that's liberating <laughs> in itself. So if you all can just like, you know, take a, take a breath and be like, oh shit, uh, our work is done. 
Uh, Tracy, thank you for being here. Ladies, there's a, a link in the show notes to Tracy's book that came out in late 2020. It's called, you got to read it, Overcoming Insecure Attachment, Eight Proven Steps to Recognizing Anxious and Avoidant Attachment Styles and Building Healthier, Happier Relationships. You are a ninja. Uh, thank you for being here. I so appreciate it. I have totally loved this conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. And ladies, we have you a shit ton of tools. Do one of them and damn life check yourself. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for tuning into today's show. So if being in an intimate relationship in which you feel 100% seen, heard, and accepted by a high caliber man is a priority for you right now, and you're interested in seeing if you're a fit for working with me and my team at Dating with Dignity, here's what I want you to do. Just head over to DWDVIP, that's D as in dating, W, D as in dating, VIP.com, and book a call to speak with my team. We'll get on the phone with you for about 60 minutes, and you'll get crystal clear on what's stopping you from finding true love right now. We'll also take a look at what you want to create, what you want your whole life to look like when you're able to finally be fully expressed as a woman in a healthy relationship with an incredible guy. And if we can help you get from where you are right now to where you want to be, we will show you the fastest path possible that makes sense for you to do that. We help smart, successful women all over the world solve this one missing piece in their life so they can finally have it all. So to see if we can help you do the same thing, head over to DWDVIP.com. I'm Marnie Batista, and let's talk soon.